One of the biggest problems with attention and transformers is that the only context you have is the context from the tokens that you are given, which is quite powerful with in-context learning, but uh, it's also limiting in that you only have those tokens that uh, you can use, and that's basically your read and write space. Now, an interesting idea would be to basically add, an, add a cache to allow the um, model to basically have like a, a read and write space, or at least have some something outside of the sequence that it can kind of work with. And to do that, you would want to add some sort of cache. Now, initially, I thought that this cache was going to be some sort of, say, like RNN, where uh, I do not know why that popped up there. Go back. There we go. Um, yeah. So some type of RNN where you have a token, or you have some set of tokens, and you would usually feed this through, say, some attention mechanism. And then you get out another set of tokens for each token, just a new representation for each token. Instead, I thought it was going to be some sort of uh, like RNN uh, style where you would have some cache type thing. You would then uh, throw this through the attention mechanism. And then you get out another representation. Um, and only that token would go through, and then that token would go out. And then you have some other attention mechanism, which takes in these two, or the same attention mechanism and the cache, and something like that. Um, the problem with this is that it requires linear time while a transformer is powerful in that you can only do one pass to get all the outputs that you require, while something like this would require um, T uh, forward passes to get uh, your, your T outputs. Um, so that's actually not what they do. They don't do this. They do something different, where you basically have this hidden state that, so you have normal attention, uh, and then they kind of add a, a cache to it, and the cache is not updated uh, per token. Instead, during training, you update the cache uh, for every batch. So every batch, you update this cache, and you freeze the cache once you're done with training. And during inference, you're going to use this cache. Um, essentially, what you're doing is you're creating a set of tokens that the model can basically use, um, a set of arbitrary feature tokens that the model finds useful while it's training that can be used uh, during inference. And they find that it, it works quite well. So yeah, let's get into it. So normal attention. Um, if you don't know what that is, attention is all you need. Um, you should watch a, a video on, on attention is all you need, because it is basically everything that powers a transformer. Um, I'll go through it really, really quick. Um, really high level. But basically, you have a set of tokens. These set of tokens will be, say, s by d. And maybe this represents the cat set, so on. And you have this attention mechanism. Uh, let me bring this down. And the attention mechanism, uh, with this, you form queries, keys, and values. So queries are going to be of the same shape. Uh, this is s by d. You form the keys. So your keys, that is s by d. And then your former values, that is also s by d. Um, and you do these via linear projections. Now, your queries and keys basically create this, uh, in this case, it'll be a three by three um, fully con uh, like dense matrix where your queries and your keys are multiplied together via QKT. And then you take the softmax of that, and you also have some normalization in there, which doesn't really matter. And basically, what this does is, uh, so this would be your keys, these would be your queries. And yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, and this would represent, say, the cat set. And this would be the cat set. And whenever you take the softmax, you basically have a distribution for each of the tokens, like so. And for each of these, uh, uh, for each of these tokens, you basically have a probability distribution. So, uh, and th that distribution tells you how your output token is going to be constructed. So maybe this will be 0 0.8, um, and this will be 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. Um, and you actually mask out this part here. So this would be, say, 0. Point, this would be 1.0, uh, 0.0. Uh, so you mask out this part here. 
um, because it's a causal. So I'll mark that like that. Um, you can only attend tokens from the past can send information to the future, but to tokens from the future cannot send information to the past. Um, maybe the word the sends some information to the word cat, um, and the word cat sends a lot of information to the word cat because you want to keep that representation of the token. And then the word sat, what did the sitting? Um, maybe you send a good amount of information, so the cat did the sitting. Um, maybe you send some information from the, and then you obviously send in for or that. Then you you want to keep your the sat information, and then basically for each of these linear combinations, you uh, you multiply it by the values here, and then you get your output representation, which will be this token would be the representation of this. So it would just be the value token. This one would be point one of the the value token, the first value token and then 0.9 of the second value token here, representing the word cat. So now it has a little information from the word the, and then the word sat would be constructed um, via 0.1 of this token, 0.3 of this token, and 0.6 of this token. So that's self-attention real quick. And you do this with multiple heads if you want by breaking up the dimension. So what they do is they say here, uh, they, they define uh, attention by just O, so O self, um, that's just normal attention right here, uh, divide by the, um, div for, divide by root D over H for your normalization, and this is just normal attention here. Now there's this new set of attention called O mem, and basically this is going to be our memory attention, and what we're going to have the model do is um, learn a interpolation between the two. So you have this um, this lambda value here, which is just some learnable constant, or uh, <laughs> some learnable constant, some some learnable scalar. And this can be between zero and one because you throw it through a sigmoid and you initialize it so that it's initially zero. So you get 100%, you only have self-attention and then you can slowly train the model to use your, your cache. So what does this look like? Now, they say you can use any form of attention if you want. Um, I'm just going to be showing self-attention because that's the most obvious, or the, and that's like the easiest and the one everyone uses. Um, but you can use other things. Uh, like if, if you want, you can use, um, say, linear attention or one of the approximation attentions, uh, as long as it gives you the, the output like self-attention does. Now, why is, now uh, OMEM is uh, self attention it's at it's it's kind of like cross attention so say we have a cache here and our cache will be uh, i will draw it down here so our cache will be of shape uh, they say tm by dm and they say that the normal sequence is going to be of shape t by d so i, I said that this, this was s earlier it's it's synonymous um, and this is just d so basically what you're going to compute is the queries will be composed of, uh, this will be T by D. Your queries will be composed of your, your sequence. So that'll be say X and maybe this will say, be say C. So this will be composed of your sequence, your input sequence. And your keys will be composed of, uh, that's T by M, that's D by M. Your, your keys and your values will be composed of your, your cache. K, TM, and DM. So you just do a linear projection of these, of uh, your cache twice and your X uh, once. And your attention matrix is going to be this matrix that is of shape. Um, this will be, uh, these are your keys, these are your queries. So this will be of shape TM by T, uh, like that. And then whenever you multiply these by the values, you multiply along uh, TM. So this is of shape TM by DM. And whenever you multiply along this dimension here, you get a sequence that is of the same shape as the output, which is T by D or T by DM. Um, so oh, uh, this is projected to, to DM. I, I forgot about that. Yeah, this is projected to, to, to DM. Uh, so the output will be of shape uh, T by DM, and you can just project this up afterwards, um, where TM 
is less than T and DM is less than D. Basically, you have this smaller cache that you're going to be, that you have information stored in. And think of these as arbitrary tokens extracting information from the sequence. So for example, this token here basically or sending information in some way. It's, it's, extracting, it's, 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 it's extracting some information from the sequence in some way. Um, it, it's, it's, it's arbitrary because we don't exactly know what it is. It's learning. It's, it's deep learning. It learns some weird representation of things. But you can think of the word cat as like this token that is, is, is extracting some information from the word sat in this case and the word the that's not extracting that much information. So maybe you, the model learns these tokens that can extract information given a certain token. So the word cat and the word set are highly correlated in some way. Um, maybe the model finds these to arbitrary tokens while training, and the cache is full of those, or the cache has a few of those tokens. Um, in this case, TM is uh, T over 2. So you have these tokens. Um, I think it's t over two. Uh, D over, uh, it, it's it's some some length. We'll, we'll call it say one twenty eight or something like that. But you have this set of tokens, and basically they're going to attend to your sequence in some way, extracting information from your sequence. And you get this output matrix, which is basically t by dm, uh, which represents the extracted information using the cache. So you have this cache, you project it twice and it extracts information from your original sequence. And you get out this here, which is O mem H. And then O self is just this part up here. That's just O self H. So uh, this over here, this, over, uh, this formula over here is just saying you're taking some of the attention, the self attention, and some of the um, cache attention. And you have the model learn this linear combination between the two. Um, starting with this being set to zero and this being set to one, um, so that it, it sticks as a normal transformer at first. Now, the important thing is how, how do you compute this cache? So, uh, and this is the weird part. This is where it gets sort of um, sort of weird. Uh, my first read through it, I, I, th I, I thought it was, um, like I said earlier, I thought it was um, a cache through time. It, it's a cache through batches, which is uh, very interesting. So basically, uh, they kind of treat it like an LSTM. And the idea is we are going to have this cache here. Uh, we're going to have this cache. We'll call this C0. And we're going to pass this cache through a forward pass. So this is a, or a, rather a training step. So this will be a training step here. And uh, in a training step, you send a batch, which is of shape um, this will be x at time zero. Uh, the index, the the index here indicates the batch number. So you send this through the, the model, uh, or you send this to the model and you update it. So it updates itself, updates itself, and after the update, you're going to get a new cache, and the new cache will give you C1. So you have uh, so a normal update rule will basically just update your transformer using normal uh, cross entropy loss. So you model each token normally, but instead of just doing that, we're also going to add this cache here, and the cache is going to update after each training step. So this is step one. You have a batch of S sequences, so that'll be B, or you have a batch of B sequences, so that'll be B by T by D. And then in your next training step, say we'll call this T1, or T2, so this is T0. In your next training step, you're going to update the cache again. And in this case, you're going to have a new batch of sequences, whatever that may be. So this is X1, and this is B by T by D. And you update the model uh, doing the forward pass. And after the update, you get another cache called C2. And you do this until your model is done updating. So how do we update this cache? So there's kind of two formulas, uh, and it uses a recurrent neural network style. Um, the first one is this, uh, it's GU. So GU is uh, the update. Uh, they, they call this the update gate, and they call this the reset gate. Um, you'll see why in a sec. But basically, all this is is this is 
you basically concatenate the context. So this is the context from the previous batch. Uh, let's say we're at time step two, at uh, batch number two. Remember, this is the, the batch, not the um, nothing in the model. So we're at batch two. Uh, yeah, we're at, we're at batch two, and you, you take the previous cache. So you take um, C1. That would be this here. So that would be This would be say C1, and this would be X bar one. Uh, X bar is just um, the the model subsampled um, to be uh, D um, instead of D, and you concatenate the two features. So um, I think uh, X bar is that. Uh, no, they also they also bring down X bar. Um, via yeah they also subsample uh, s bar so or uh, x bar so you have to interpolate x bar to be of shape um t by m as well and that way you can concatenate the two together and the way they do that is if you have a set of tokens uh and let's say the cache has to be of size two i think what they do is they take say they do like an average pooling so uh they do some interpolation and this will give you two tokens and that represents your cache size. So if this is our original sequence, then you, you have to uh, basically interpolate the sequence to get a smaller representation. And that's just so that the shapes work out uh, for the cache, because the cache cannot hold infinite length context. It can only hold a certain number of tokens. So you interpolate the you interpolate the sequence X, so whatever your input sequence is, and you get out the subsequence TM by DM, so this compressed sequence. You then concatenate the two uh, your cache and your your sequence together. So cache and sequence, you concatenate them together along the dimension, uh, the embedding dimension, and you just project these twice and you throw them through a sigmoid function. So you have these two gating mechanisms uh, and they're composed of whatever D and C are at that, at that time step. So whatever the previous cache is over here and whatever X is, whatever your current inputs are. Now, what do you do with these? So there's two parts to it. The first part is C tilde T. And basically, C tilde T will, uh, the first step of C tilde T, it basically removes unimportant information from the cache. Uh, that is the first part of our update. You can think of it as if there's a token it doesn't find useful, it will remove it via GR. So if GR is, say, zero for some token, it'll remove it, uh, it'll remove it from C T minus one. And you concatenate that with X T and you multiply it by some weight. So you basically are joining the cache, the new cache, and the new tokens at time T, and you're multiplying by them by a weight. So remove things from the cache you don't want. You then add X T to this and you multiply it by some weight, getting some new scaled cache. And what, you, what do you do with this cache? You basically say, okay, so we have this old cache, we have this new cache, and the new cache is composed of XT and CT minus one uh, projected down. And you say, uh, or, and GU basically says, how much of the old cache do I wanna keep and how much of the, the new cache do I wanna have? So this is our update rule for CT and that will give you C2. So basically all you're doing is you have this one gate that tells you how much of your original cache is actually like what tokens in your original cache do you want to keep and how much do you want to keep of that you then update it by adding xt to that so basically that allows you to add tokens from the current sequence if that's useful information for the model and then you update the cache by saying we have this old cache we have this new cache tell me uh what do you want from each of those and that is our update rule that's the update rule and you do this for each step in the batch uh, they also note here that CT is BTM by DM, and you average across the batch dimension to fit the cache size. So that's just a quick side note. So that's how you update the cache. Uh, they show that over here. So over here, you have this input sequence, and you basically subsample the input sequence. You then send this through the GRC update. They call this a GRC. And this will output your, your new cache. Um, GRC is what we showed over here or what we showed down here. Basically, you take your, your subsample tokens 
and your uh, your your previous cache. You compute GR and GU, your your reset gate and your update gate. You then reset the the caches and you add your your sequence or you you reset your caches. You add the sequence to that and then you update the caches. So that's the GRC update. You take your sequence, you update the cache, and you get a new cache out. You then do the cache detention, which is what was up here. Uh, you compute the the queries from X, and you compute the why don't I put K there? <laughs> That's a V. You compute the keys and the values from your cache, and you do normal self attention where everything comes from X. Um, sorry, the keyboard's popping up. I don't I don't know why it keeps popping up, but you compute normal self attention, and then you do a linear combination between the two, where this is initialized to zero at first, so you have no cache attention at first, and then this is initialized to one at first, so you have full self-attention at first. And that's basically your layer. Um, now, the nice part about this is that, like I showed before, where you have this sequence up here, uh, it was before with the LSTM looking thing, um, this requires a single forward pass because the cache is updated every batch as opposed to within the transformer. And it's a very unique way of modeling this. Now. Um, TM and DM basically control how much information you can throw in the cache. And you do have to add a few extra parameters for the cache detention part. Uh, but those should be smaller because the, like it's not doubling the number of parameters because these are, um, in terms of DM, these are DM matrices. So they're smaller matrices. OK, so now onto the experiments. So. Hopefully this makes sense. Basically, you just have this cache that you're using, and you update the cache between uh, training steps. And oh, after training, you freeze the cache. You freeze the cache after training. Uh, they mentioned that down here. Down here, I think. It was somewhere here. <laughs> uh, the accumulated caches are stored within the network parameters after training and will be used directly for inference without any further updating. Uh, so you can actually compute these ahead of time, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and, oh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you basically have this cache here, and you use this cache, um, you use this frozen cache during inference. And basically, these represent some features that the model learned during training that are useful during inference. That's basically what it learned. It learned these feature tokens that can be used, that are really useful during training, that will probably be useful over uh, during inference, um, assuming it didn't overfit. And since it's a transformer, it probably didn't. And um, the first result is they they look at this with a VIT. And with a VIT, if we go over here, they have VIT. And they have uh, their cached VIT. No, they have PVT. So they have this model called PVT right here. And then they have a cached PVT, which is the screen one here. And it, you can see that the model capacity uh, is pretty equal, but it does way better. So my first thought was, does this actually do what it's what you're hoping it to do. And the idea is that if you stack more layers, which is what this part does here, so you stack more layers, then this the, the number of parameters added through here should be worth it. And obviously, in the vision case, the number of parameters you do add are much more worth it than if you were to just stack more layers, because you add a few more flops shown here, and it does way better. The performance is way better. In fact, you can have less flops and the the accuracy is better, at least for the PVT. And then PVT2, uh, which is red here, uh, and then they have cached PVT2, uh, which is this one up here, the purple one. So for this case, PVT2 and uh, the VIT case, it does better uh, with cached. And it's better than just stacking more layers. Uh, a cool thing that they show is that this is what self-attention finds, this is what cache attention finds. And you can see that clearly cache attention does find useful features uh, in the image case. You can't visualize this with text that well, as, as much. 
So clearly in the vision case, it is finding useful features because it finds things that look plausibly, look possible or look plausible within the given image. So uh, yeah, there's some more um, ablations they do. Uh, this one's very interesting. So the idea with this, uh, with this um, visualization is remember that uh, sigma lambda h is basically how much is it using the cached. So if this was one, then it's only using cached. And if this was zero, then it's only using self-attention. And the really, really interesting part is that it starts off with a really high value. So in the first layers, it is relying on the cached attention very, like it's relying on it a lot uh, in multiple, at least in the, the vision cases. Uh, not sure about the text cases, but in the vision cases, the early layers are obviously relying on cache attention um, more than self-attention. And that's obvious because more than 50% of the output is the cache attention. If it wasn't relying on this, then this would be like 0.1 or something like that. And it, it would be obvious that it wasn't using it. But since this is higher than 0.1, it's much higher than 0.1, it's much higher than 0.5 it's using cache attention um, quite a bit in the early layers. And it's interesting that it has this drop off where the reliance on cache attention is much lower uh, in feature layers. And you can see that in, um, in the other models, the other vision models as well, it has this drop off where it initially relies on cache attention quite a bit. And then it has a drop off, uh, same here, where it drops off um, in the later layers. So that's an interesting thing that they, they notice with cache attention. And I really like how they put this in here it really shows that the the cache attention is doing uh, it it is helping a lot. So they also have some more ablations. Uh, they or more uh, studies. So they have the object detection, and I think that was um, yeah that was PVT. Uh, it obviously it does better as shown above uh, that they showed in the graph. They have a uh, language modeling. And if we look here, the language modeling task uh, here, it is a bit lower than normal. And for the language modeling, I'm wondering if the number, if this is just due to the number of parameters or if it's not, I would be curious if stacking more layers and getting equal number of parameters results in a graph looking like this for the text modeling. Um, because I think they just add on the cached attention here instead of increasing the initial transformer by a layer to, to equal the number of parameters. So I'm curious if these results are just because you add more parameters or if they're because of the cached attention. The, the vision case, it's obvious that cached attention helps a lot, but here I'm, I'm not quite sure because they I think they just added cached attention as opposed to adding cached attention and then comparing it to um, a baseline with uh, equal number of parameters. Uh, that's also seen here where you, you get a, a little bit of an increase um, with cached attention. And I, uh, I'm not sure if this is because of the number of parameters or if cached attention actually does help a lot with, um, with text modeling. And it's also seen here where it's just like, it's a slight increase in, it's a slight increase on like um, the vision case, so. Uh, that's one thing that I, I was a little skeptical about. Um, so it obviously helps in the vision case. I'm, I'm curious if it, if it also is helping in the text case. Uh, not, not quite sure. It may be some. It may be just be because you add more parameters. Be interesting to look at though. Uh, not quite, quite sure if they mentioned that. I don't think they did. I, I may have missed it if, if they did mention that. But yeah, obviously works in the vision case. It's obviously utilizing it in the vision case. Not sure if it's doing that with the text case. Uh, yeah, I think that is it. That is, uh, cached transformers. Basically all you're doing is you're adding a cache. It's being updated through the batches. It finds these features that are really useful and then you use those during inference. Uh, yeah. And that is cache transformers.